Archdiocese Today is made possible by Ratterman Family Funeral Homes. And so now, what we're ready to do is start looking at themes. Lots of ways of looking at scripture, but we're going to take a look at some major themes to kind of get the big picture of what the Old Testament and the New Testament are all about. Uh, and to kind of see how those themes kind of cross over. Okay, uh, You're going to see with most of these themes, they're not confined to, to just the Hebrew scriptures. They actually continue into the Christian scriptures or the New Testament. Okay, So that will be the rest of the, the focus this evening. I want to touch on... Um, let's see. Some of you were asking last time about some outlines and something helpful to, to kind of put things in perspective for you. One of the handouts that I've given you tonight, before we get into themes, there is a green handout. The story of the Hebrew Scriptures from Understanding the Old Testament by Bernhard Anderson. Okay? This is one of the best little summaries I ever found on the Old Testament. And what he does is gives you a paragraph and matches the paragraph with the books of the Old Testament. This is where you're going to find this story. Okay? Uh, Anderson wrote this text, Understanding the Old Testament. This is one of the, the, one of the books that, that, I'm going to, that I have given you in your bibliography this evening. This has gone into the fourth edition, and his daughter now is starting to do his work. Uh, so it's a, this is kind of a standard Old Testament book that's been around for a while. Uh, so I would highly recommend it if you want to get into scripture study a little bit more. But that's where this summary comes from. It's his material. So this kind of helps with uh, kind of the dating and matching up some of those events that we talked about with those particular books of the Bible. So you can read that at your leisure. Okay. Themes. Lots of themes. We're going to take a look at the major ones. So themes in Scripture. One of the first themes that we run into very early in Genesis. In fact, we're going to pick up the Genesis story. We're going to go back to chapter 3. One of those themes that, that plays itself out right away, very early, is the theme of fall and redemption. Or fall and forgiveness. Some people prefer that word. I don't know if you brought your handouts from last time, but I gave you a handout that showed you the ups and downs of Israel's history. This purple one. Okay? One of the ways that the ancient Hebrew people are going to understand this chart is that when things are going well, or things are on the upswing, okay, the people are going to perceive this being blessed. Okay? They're obedient to covenant. Things are going well. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. When things are going down, when things go bad, when they're conquered, when the wars go bad, when they, when they start losing their, their, their herds to disease, uh, when their babies die, in childbirth, when all these bad things happen, the understanding is going to be that somehow they have fallen from, from grace. Now, they wouldn't use the word grace, but uh, they have sinned in some way. Okay? So, remember, the Old, the Old Testament perspective is this rhythm of fall and restoration, or fall and redemption. And we're going to see that played out from the get-go in chapter 3 of Genesis. So if you would open up your Bibles 
to chapter 3. You should have a subtitle, The Fall of Man, or The Fall of Humanity, or The Fall of the First Couple. So this is a, chapter 3 goes with the chapter 2 story. The Fall of Man. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat it or even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Okay, this is a sidebar question. What's the first fruit? What's this fruit? Traditionally, what's this fruit? What does it say there? No, it doesn't. It says fig leaves. What's the fruit? Doesn't say. What, what uh, translation of the Bible gives us apple? Does anyone know? It's not there. There is no translation that says anything about an apple. It's a fruit. It's one of those things over, the, over time that the tradition has imposed onto the story. There's nothing about an apple. It could be a fig. That makes sense. It could be a kumquat. I mean, we don't know what it is. <laughs> we don't know what it is. Okay? But um, over the centuries, our tradition has imposed apple onto the story. And it's so much a part of the culture. You know, apple computers. You know, apples tied with knowledge. Okay? Tree of knowledge from Genesis. Where does that come from? Two theories about where the apple comes from, and it goes back to the Middle Ages. Uh, one has to do with uh, the, the time of the building of the great cathedrals. And remember that during the time when the cathedrals are built in Europe, people still, the average person, could not read or write. So they learned their Bible stories going to the cathedral and looking at the stained glass. Because the stained glass would tell stories from the Bible. And so when the artist would depict Adam and Eve, they used a fruit that everyone was familiar with. Apple. Another possibility, there was a time in the church tradition that we celebrated the feast day of Adam and Eve. We don't have that anymore, but we had the feast day of Adam and Eve, and it was December 24th. And it was intentional that it was December 24th. And so uh, in the times when we had uh, you know, minstrel shows that would travel from place to place and you'd have people that would retell the story of Adam and Eve, you know, they would do the shows, again, they would use the fruit that was common to the people. That was available to them, the apple. So it became imposed onto the Christian conscience. But if you look at any translation of the Bible, it will only say fruit. There's no apple. That was a long sidebar story, but <laughs> that's just uh, an extra thing to know. Okay, so what happens here? Uh, when the fruit is given to... Oh, let's, let me back up. When the woman takes the fruit, then she hands it to the man, what happens to them? Their eyes open. What does that mean? They become knowledgeable. They're seeing themselves differently. Is it good? What do they do with themselves? They cover themselves up. They become uncomfortable with themselves all of a sudden. So they got to cover up. Let's see what happens. It's going to get worse. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 8. 
When they heard the sound of the Lord God moving about in the garden at the breezy time of the day, notice how God's depicted. This is how we know it's a continuation of chapter 2. Because chapter 2, how was God making the man? Getting that clay, using his hands. Okay, so what's God doing now? He's tiptoeing through the tulips. He's, he's walking through the garden during the breezy time of the day. Very human. The man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God then called to the man and asked him, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat. Now what's happened? He's hiding from God. He's hiding from God. Okay, we hid from you. Keep that in mind. Now, it really gets interesting. Verse 12. The man replied, now this is the man's, you know, coming up with an answer to this. The woman whom you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and so I ate it. She made me do it. <laughs> you know, we talk about a culture where we don't take re responsibility. It's an old theme. <laughs> Taking responsibility for self. The Lord God then asked the woman, why did you do such a thing? The woman answered, the serpent tricked me into it, and so I ate it. What's this story about? The writer never uses the word, but what, what, what's it about? Temptation. It is about temptation. But it's also bigger than it's giving in to the temptation. It's sin. sin. It's sin. doesn't use the word, but what happens when, you know, when we actually commit sin? We feel guilty. We become uncomfortable with ourselves, right? And then there's a separation between us and God, Right? And then the other per person or the people who are involved, there's a barrier between us and them. So there's a fracturing of relationship here. The Genesis writer, this, this writer is very, very in tune into what sin is without ever using the word. This is what happens when disobedience occurs. So we have this picture of God, humanity, the earth, all creatures, the sense of oneness, and then disobedience happens, and then everything starts falling apart. And so now there's a series of consequences. The Lord God goes to the serpent first, because this is uh, 314. Because you have done this, you shall be banned from all the animals and from all the wild creatures. On your belly shall you crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. To the woman he said, I will intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children, yet your urge shall be your husband and he shall be your master. To the man he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat, cursed be the ground because of you. In toil shall you eat its yield all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you as you eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face shall you eat bread, shall you get bread to eat, until you return to the ground from which you were taken. For you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. That's some serious stuff. Okay? Serious stuff. Why was God so hard? That's a good question. That's a good question. The writer here is plugging into some things. The writer is reflecting on the condition of humanity. So you think about this time period. You know, we think in chapters 2, 3 may have been written down for the first time around 1000 BC. Okay? Average person trying to eke out a living in the world is having a difficult time. Life is not easy. Okay? It's difficult to grow your food. I mean, think about that now, the drought that we've gone through. 
how difficult it is now, what must have been like back then without all the modern things, okay? Uh, women having a difficult time giving birth. You know, it was not uncommon to lose a wife when a child was being born, or to lose the child. You know, there's a question of, you know, why is uh, polygamy allowed in this culture during this time? It was practical. If you had more than one spouse, men having more than one wife, that would ensure the male line because there was a good chance you were going to lose a wife or two in childbearing. Okay? So life is difficult. And so he's plugging in, the writers of Genesis here, writing this chapter 3 story, is, is, is tying this in. That the difficulties of life are somehow connected to the sinful condition. That it shouldn't be this way. Life is too hard. Is there some connection between this division, this struggle in life, and our, our, our sinful condition? That's the question that he's looking at. Okay? And, and, there, and there's some truth in this. Okay? So before disobedience, there's a sense of unity and wholeness after Everything comes apart. There's division. There's fracture. Not only between God and us and between us and one another, but between us and the world with the environment. Okay? But, this is the fall, but does he wipe out, does God wipe out everything he creates? No, he doesn't. Let's look. Verse 21. For the man and his wife, the Lord God, made leather garments with which he clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing what is good and what is bad. Therefore he must not be allowed to put out his hand to take fruit from the tree of life also, and thus eat of it and live forever. So the consequence of disobedience, the consequence of sin, the ultimate consequence is death. Because look what he's implying. You know, if there is no disobedience... He's going to live forever. The man and the woman. They are going to live forever. The Lord God therefore banished him from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he had been taken. When he expelled the man, he settled him east of the Garden of Eden and he stationed the cherubim and the fiery revolving sword to guard the way to the tree of life. So you've got this cherubim, angelic creature that's guarding the, 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 the gateway, if you will, back into the garden. Okay? But, there's a second chance. And God actually goes to the trouble of making clothes for these people. And sends them on their way. There's a new opportunity. Okay? Now, is life going to be the same as before? No. And that's going to be one of the interesting sub-themes when you go through the Old Testament and you look at this theme of fallen redemption, that when the relationship's broken, it's going to be restored, but the relationship's not going to be the same. Now, that'll be the Old Testament. When we go to the New Testament, it's going to be a little different. Okay? So, here we have this introduction of the, this theme of fallen redemption. Now, uh, the serpent. Traditionally, in, in, in Christianity, how do we understand the serpent? Who's the serpent? The devil made me do it. That's, the, that's, the, that's Satan, the devil. Okay. Now remember what I said about, did we do the cosmology piece last time, about the, the ancient Hebrews' understanding of uh, the afterlife? We talk about that? Sheol, land of the dead. Okay. Remember what I said about Sheol, land of the dead. It's not a place of reward, not a place of punishment. It's land of the dead. You're just there. Okay. So that means... There's no concept yet of a devil in hell. Okay? So what's the serpent in this story? The serpent, again, takes on symbolic significance. And this story in chapter 3 is a condemnation of the Canaanite religions that Israel, ancient Israel, is constantly competing with. So in chapter 3... Serpent basically represents the Canaanite cults. The 
there are deities that are mentioned throughout the Old Testament, and one of them that turns up quite a bit is a god named Baal or Baal. I've heard it pronounced two different ways. Okay? He has a consort. He has a wife. And her name is Aneth. Depending on which group of people you're dealing with in the Middle East, they're depicted a little differently. But a lot of times they show up as serpents. Uh, Baal sometimes is represented as a snake himself. Aneth a lot of times is depicted as holding serpents in her hands. Okay? But they're deities that are connected with, with snakes. Now why the snake? In the ancient world, a snake was seen as a divine creature. Because it was the only creature in nature that could renew itself. Okay? They could watch the, the serpent take its skin off shed its skin. And so a lot of the ancient people believed that if you left a serpent alone, it would live forever because it was divine. So you had these religious cults that grew around this belief in the serpent or the snake. Okay? And Baal, or Baal, becomes one of the rival gods throughout the Old Testament. You know, there's a great story about Elijah fighting the priest of Baal. Okay, so it's one of those things that, that's, that's constantly uh, a threat to Israel, these, these cultic religions are in and around Israel. And so, by depicting the serpent in this way, it's actually a condemnation of these cults and these religions. It really doesn't have anything to do with the devil or Satan yet. Okay? Later on, Christianity will, will, uh, will give it that interpretation. And in fact, uh, when our theology of Mary develops, going through the New Testament, uh, we'll see that in the New Testament, Jesus will be named as the new Adam. Okay? Mary will become the new Eve. And if you recall, a statuary of Mary, have you ever seen Mary where she's standing on the head of a serpent? Okay? It's a reference back to this. Okay? Because Mary is the new Eve. Okay? And a lot of times the serpent, what's the serpent got in his mouth? Apple. Okay? So that, that's all rooted from this story, from this tradition. Okay? So, but chapter 3 gives us this beginning of fall and redemption. Chapter 4 continues. Cain and Abel. Here's a story you're familiar with. The man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Abel became a keeper of flocks, and Cain a tiller of the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the soil, while Abel, for his part, brought one of the best firstlings of the flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not. Cain greatly resented this and was crestfallen. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so resentful and crestfallen? If you do well, you can hold up your head. But if not, sin is a demon lurking at the door. His urge is towards you, yet you can be his master." Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out in the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord then said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil. Therefore you shall be banned from the soil that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. If you till the soil, it shall no longer give you its produce. You shall become a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Since you have now banished me from the soil, I must avoid your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth. Anyone may kill me at sight. Not so, the Lord said to him. If anyone kills Cain, Cain shall be avenged sevenfold. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone shall kill him at sight. Cain then left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So what happens? Are things getting better or worse? Worse. Now we have murder entering the picture. One brother kills another. And we're really not sure what the reason is. It seems like it's jealousy. But we're not really given a good reason. And then Cain's banished. Again, Cain falls. And he has a very serious consequence. He's banished from his community. Now, banishment in the ancient world is serious business because it is like a death sentence. 
you can't go back. And if you're banished, your family would mourn you as though you were dead. Because you couldn't come back. If you did come back, then you would be killed. So banishment is serious business. And it's worse than what his parents received because now one of his curses is he can't plan anything. Nothing's going to grow for him. So he wanders and he's forced to leave. Uh, and then you have this Mark of Cain. What's this Mark of Cain business? The Mark of Cain is probably a, a cultural reference to tattooing. We think tattooing is a new thing. Tattooing is old. It goes back a long time. Don't tell your teenagers that tattooing is in the Bible. <laughs> But uh, marking the body was a very common thing. And in this ancient world, tattooing or marking your body was common to identify what family you belong to or what tribe you belong to. It could be beneficial. It could also be a problem. If you belong to a very powerful tribe that ruled a particular valley, uh, people coming up upon you would, would probably respect you and give you a, a lot of room. If you were at war, or if you were involved in a family feud, the mark would give you away. Okay? It's probably some kind of tattooing that, that's being referenced here. And then notice we have a, a dilemma here. Verse 17. Going into the next section. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. What's the problem? Where did the wife come from? That's right. If there's only Adam and Eve in the beginning, where did the wife come from for, for a Cain? You know, was there another creation somewhere else and no one bothered to tell us? You know, what happened? You know, don't know. And the writer's not concerned about tidying that up for us. It's not an issue. But again, you know, it's that challenge. I mean, if you take it literally, you know, here's another question you have to deal with. How do you explain the wife of Cain? Tony, it's good to be with you again here at this beautiful funeral home. Thank you, Barbara. It's good to have you with us. I don't know if people realize that you operate two funeral homes, not only this one on Cain Run Road, but one down on Market Street. That's right. Um, the whole staff that operates this funeral home also operates the one on Market Street, and we do go back and forth quite a bit. The one on Market Street is, I'm proud to say, the one that uh, our grandfather began. It's the first Raderman funeral home in the city that, as such. A, a funeral home has to be at, at two needs. They have to take care of two needs, the family of the deceased and then also the visitors that come in. Well, that's right. Um, it can't be just pretty on its own uh, merits. Uh, the whole purpose of a funeral home is to provide a place for families to receive the the people that are important to them. And uh, since, since the funeral home was built, we've even added a lot of things to the outside to, to soften it up, and, uh, uh, and, we, and we've done that. Um, so when you come in here, the idea is, is that you're in a very special place. Well, I know you've done some renovation to mm -hmm. the lounges mm -hmm. and some other places. Mm -hmm. Would you show those to me? Well, I'd be, gl I'd be glad to. Okay. Come on. Thank you. Okay. Tony, I think one of the most important places in a funeral home is the lounge for the family. Tell us about this wonderful lounge. Okay, thank you. Um, this lounge is designed to uh, accommodate three families, three good-sized families at once. And uh, a lot of times people bring food in, and so we have two refrigerators now. We used to have no refrigerators, now we have two refrigerators. We decided last summer that we would make the inside of the funeral home non-smoking and so we we asked people to smoke outside and then that worked out good for the summertime but when the winter start coming it was a little uncomfortable for them so we built these um, partitions of safety glass Tony I think probably one of the greatest things that a family can do is to pre-arrange for funeral a lot of times people are particular about when I die I want certain, a certain thing to take place. And you have that opportunity when it's prearranged. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just gives a real good roadmap to the family so they know what to follow and how to proceed. It doesn't have to be paid for ahead of time. It doesn't cost a thing. It only takes about 45 minutes or an hour. Tony, thank you for allowing me to visit. And, and I have to say, truly, there is a beautiful spirit in, in this space. Thank you. I like to think that there is, too. There is for me. Another challenge. But notice 
uh, that with the second generation, when we come to this issue of fallen redemption, uh, the sin's got a little bit more serious, and the word sin is actually used in the text in verse 7. Then what happens? Well, it's interesting. In chapter 5, we have the first genealogy. Generations from Adam to Noah. Now, notice something here. Now, if you were to read this whole thing, you'd probably go to sleep about a fourth of the way in. Okay? Because it's very repetitive. But I'm going to ask you to look at the, the first few... Uh, first couple of paragraphs and see if you notice something here. Um, go to verse 3. When Adam was 130 years old, Adam was 130 years old when he begot a son in his likeness after his image and he named him Seth. Adam, named, or Adam lived 800 years after the birth of Seth. He had other sons and daughters. The whole lifetime of Adam was 930 years. Then he died. When Seth was 105 years old, he became the father of Enosh. Seth lived 807 years after the birth of Enosh, and he had other sons and daughters. The whole lifetime of Seth was 912 years, then he died. What sticks out? Boy, they lived a long time. I always thought years may be equated to seasons. Could be. We really don't know how, how the, uh, the ancients would have understood the seasons. might be a little bit more accurate. But if you continue looking at the last line of each of those paragraphs, what happens to the numbers? They, get, they go down. They get smaller. What's going on here? Remember what I said. Remember what I said about the ultimate consequence of disobedience. It's death. So with each generation of people, people are living less and less. Okay, because sin continues to spread from one generation to the next. Now, there's one exception. You heard the expression, as old as Methuselah. This is where it comes from. Chapter 5, verse 25. When Methuselah was 187 years old, he became the father of Lamech. Methuselah lived 782 years after the birth of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. The whole lifetime of Methuselah was 969 years, then he died. He gets the prize for living the longest. Now, we have no idea why Methuselah is able to live that long. The understanding in the ancient world is if you live a long time, you are seen as blessed by God. You're doing right. That's why elders are respected. Elders are seen as being very wise. And if you live for a long time, you're doing something right. You must be close to the divine. Okay? So Methuselah is perceived as being very blessed. Now, why in this particular sequence, what does he do? What, what, what incredible thing that he does? What act of faith? We have no idea. No idea at all. But this is where Methuselah comes from. And he lives the longest. This genealogy is doing two things. One, it's showing that sin is spreading from one generation to the next. Humanity is living less, not as long. The second thing this genealogy does, it covers a very long period of time in a short amount of space. So it's a bridge. So what are we bridging? We're bridging the story of Cain and Abel with the story of Noah, which starts in chapter 6, continues through 7, 8, and concludes in chapter 9. And it is a continuation of this. Okay? But things are continuing to get worse. If you look at chapter 6, verse 5. Warning of the flood. When the Lord saw how great was man's wickedness on earth and how no desire that his heart conceived was ever anything but evil, he regretted that he made man on the earth and his heart was grieved. So the Lord said, I will wipe out from the earth the men whom I have created, and not only the men, but also the beasts and the creeping things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. And so we get the descendants, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 11, In the eyes of God the earth was corrupt and full of lawlessness. When God saw how corrupt the earth had become, since all mortals led depraved lives on earth, he said to Noah, 
I have decided to put an end to all mortals on the earth. The earth is full of lawlessness because of them, so I will destroy them and all life on earth. So right from the get-go, even though humanity is going through a very serious fall, the redemption's already there. Noah. Humanity is going to survive through this, through this man and this man's family. So it's continuing this. Now, this is a, a pretty extensive story about building uh, this incredible uh, structure, this ark, and we have the animals that are going to be gathered up. But here's an interesting thing, kind of going back again to um, taking the, the literal account. Let's look at a, a bit of a contradiction. Let's look at, let's see. Let's look at the end of chapter 6, verse 19. And we'll go into the beginning of chapter 7. Of all other living creatures, you shall bring two into the ark, one male and one female, that you may keep them alive with you. Of all kinds of birds, of all kinds of beasts, and of all kinds of creeping things, two of each shall come into the ark with you to stay alive. Moreover, you are to provide yourself with all the food that is to be eaten and stored away, that it may serve as provisions for you and for them. This Noah did. He carried out all the commands that God gave him. We're, we're used to this, right? Gathering up the animals two by two, no problem. Okay, but look at the beginning of chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your household, for you alone in this age have I found to be truly just. Of every clean animal, take with you seven pairs, a male and its mate, and of the unclean animals, one pair, a male and its mate. Likewise, of every clean bird of the air, seven pairs, a male and a female, and of all the unclean birds, one pair, a male and female. Thus you shall keep their issue alive over all the earth. Now what's that all about? Where did that come from? You know, we sing songs about Noah and the ark and two by two. Nobody sings songs about seven pairs of clean animals and one pair of the unclean. You don't go to the store and get a Noah's ark with seven pairs of clean animals. It's two by two. What's going on? Well, some Levite rewrote the chapter. You are right on. <laughs> you got it. It's a priest who's adding this to the story after the Babylonian captivity. And why does he do it? He, most scholars think that the writer adds this piece for one simple reason. To show that Noah is a good Jew. Period. Because this deals with dietary laws. Clean versus unclean animals. Okay? So it's an add-on. Again, you know, that literal fundamentalist approach, it'd be hard to explain that. How do you, how do you reconcile those? Again, we're, de we're dealing with an addition to the story. Okay, so the great flood comes, chapter 7, verse 6, uh, and then chapter 8, you've got Noah uh, waiting and sending out the, the, the birds to, to see if there's dry land, and then chapter 9, you have the ark resting on Mount Ararat, and you have this covenant, it's the first time we see this word. This covenant that God will establish with Noah. Okay? And that's when we know we've gotten to this part. There's a new relationship established. So in the waters of the flood, you have this cleansing, if you will. A wiping away. Okay? kind of see where our sacramental theology on baptism comes from. It's, kind of, it's, it's rooted in this story. This notion of water cleansing, wiping away, renewing. And then out of this you have this family, you knowing the family coming out of the ark to establish a new relationship to start over again. Remember what we said about covenant. Covenant is an agreement. It's a promise. And this covenant is a very simple one. You know, God promises not to destroy the world by flood again. It's very simple. Okay? And that's the covenant. So the fall, humanity continues to sin. There's lawlessness. Noah redeems humanity. He is the just one who survives. He gives humanity the next opportunity. Humanity continues.
there is a sense of redemption. Okay? Any questions about how that story reflects the fall? Yes, Jenny? So are you talking about how that doesn't really happen? Do what? I mean, that's not the whole word. Oh, well, the... It's interesting about this particular story. Do you take that literally? Is it all symbolic? That's one of those great archaeological debates that's been going on for a while. For the most part, we think it's, it's more symbolic. But there's a lot of basis for this story. Uh, one thing, uh, most cultures of the world have a flood story. Second, it's not too crazy of an idea that if you reflect on the concept of what the world meant for the ancient people, their concept of the world is pretty limited. So if you think about floods that have happened even of recent, you know, in the Midwest or in Texas, and if you think about, you know, if you're somebody that has never moved from your, from your location, and your sense of borders isn't all that great, okay, and a great flood comes, you could say that your known world is underwater. You could say that. The other thing about the flood story is, is that uh, there's a group of um, scientists and archaeologists that have been studying the Black Sea. And they've come to a conclusion that the Black Sea at one time was a valley. And they've been, uh, uh, they've been, there's a book out now, it's called the Noah's Flood. And I can't think of the authors right now. But uh, they, uh, there was a group of scientists that were taking these tubes, these real long tubes, and they were shoving these tubes down into the, 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 the bottom of, of, the, of the sea and pulling up these layers, these strata of, of, of earth and mud and things. And what they discovered was that there were some, a lot of strata that indicated that at one time that there were people that lived in the Black Sea, that this was a valley, and that perhaps this world was wiped out by a flood, a major flood, a catastrophic event. Okay, and so the, the theory was, you know, maybe, maybe Noah's story isn't just a symbolic story. Maybe there's something to that. Okay, so I'm not willing to go all the way and say, you know, it's totally a symbolic story. I mean, it has symbolic significance and all that, but it's interesting that so many cultures and so many peoples have flood stories. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Very much. Yes. That's right. Gilgamesh. The only difference, though, Gilgamesh is promised to become one of the gods. Right. Yes, that's the only difference. Noah's not given that opportunity. Very good. Yes. So, yes and no, Jenny. <laughs> Yes, so that's a, that's a yes and a no. Good question. Okay, so you can see how in these opening chapters of Genesis that you have this sense of this fall and forgiveness. And it actually concludes in chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. This is the last of the fall stories. It's very short and it's a very interesting little story. Chapter 11. The whole world spoke the same language using the same words. While men were migrating in the east, they came upon a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us mold bricks and harden them with fire. They used bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky and so make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered all over the earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men had built. Then the Lord said, If now, while they are one people, all speaking the same language, they have started to do this, nothing will later stop them from doing whatever they presume to do. Let us then go down and there confuse their language, so that one will not understand what another says. Thus the Lord scattered them from, from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the speech of all the world. It was from that place that he scattered them all over the earth. Now it's not clear exactly what the sin is. It, it could be arrogance, it could be the desire to reach the gods, okay, or to reach God. Uh, because remember what I said about the Babylonians in particular, and in some translations of the Bible this is called Tower of Babylon, not, not just Tower of Babel. 
Uh, so remember the Babylonians, they, they built these um, uh, temple-like structures because the idea was the, the higher the structure, the closer you could get to God. So we think that's where this particular story is coming from. The other thing about the writer for this story is another insight. And that is the issue of language as something that is divisive. Now, if you think back then, how difficult it would have been, you know, from tribe to tribe, culture to culture, people to people, how difficult it would be to overcome a language barrier. You know, how are, and think about this for a moment, just for yourself. What is your reaction, your first reaction, when you're at the Kroger or the grocery store or the, the Kohl's or wherever you shop and you hear another language and you don't understand what's being spoken, what is your first knee-jerk reaction to it? Some people don't bother them. Tell them a secret or something. I know there's something going on. I don't know what it is. Any other reactions? They might be talking about me. <laughs> might be talking about me. Sometimes it just makes us uncomfortable to hear another language in my grocery or at my Walmart or wherever I shop. Okay? Now this is 21st century North American people. We're part of the great melting pot, you know? But we still have trouble with that. Okay? Now think about back then in the ancient world how difficult it would have would, it would have been to overcome a language barrier. So it's a very insightful story that language creates a division enough to cause wars, misunderstandings. Okay, so there's another truth here that's being revealed in the story. Not just about the arrogance of human beings wanting to be like the divine, okay, but there's an insight as to the issue of culture and language that that too can be divisive. So when you take a look at Genesis 3 to 11, you see this continuum of fall and redemption. And the notion that this disobedience that begins in 3 continues with each generation and progresses. Now in 11, we're not given really that, that notion of redemption until you get to the naming of Abraham. And then you have the introduction of Abraham uh, in 20, 11 verse 27. So how's the redemption going to happen? How's the unification of the world going to happen again? It's going to begin with the person of Abraham. And so this is the lead into the Abraham story. Who brings us in to the next theme and that is covenant. Okay? Now, this fall in redemption, I'm not going to let go of this yet. I'm gonna, this fall in redemption theme continues all throughout the scriptures. And one of the stories where it, it uh, takes on some prominence is in Samuel, where it talks about uh, David and his fall from grace. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and look at that story. Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11, David's sin. Okay, again, we're thinking about theme, fall and redemption. Chapter 11, David's sin. At the turn of the year, when kings go out on campaign, David sent out Joab along with his officers and the army of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. David, however, remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David rose from his siesta and strolled about on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing who was very beautiful. David had inquiries made about the woman and was told she is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and the wife of Joab's armor bearer, Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers and took her. When she came to him, he had relations with her at a time when she was just purified after her monthly period. She then returned to her house, but the woman had conceived and sent the information to David, I am with child. Okay, let's put this in context. What's, David, what's going on with David? David is at the height of his power. David has made Jerusalem the capital of Israel. He's brought the Ark of the Covenant to, uh, to Jerusalem. 
He has pushed the Philistines back. This is the golden age of Israel. Okay? So David is mighty. He has a wife. He's got concubines. And what happens? Looking out on the balcony, and this woman's taking a bath on the roof across the way. Which is a little too convenient, if in my opinion. <laughs> but she's taking a bath on the roof. Just happens to be below the balcony of the king. <laughs> which is very interesting. And then David takes her and she becomes pregnant. Does not belong to David. She is not a concubine. She's not a wife. And she gets pregnant. Now, it says here that she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Okay. The Hittites were a group of people that come from the north. And David, like many kings, um, would hire out soldiers. So the Hittites are a separate people and they're kind of mercenaries, so he hires mercenaries to be part of his army. So that's why there's, there's, a, there's an intention of, of mentioning that he's not an Israelite. He's a Hittite. He is a foreigner. Okay? But he's very, he's very loyal to David. And he's very loyal to the cause. So this is, what, this is how David's going to solve this problem. Verse 6. David, therefore, sent a message to Joab Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When he came, David questioned him about Joab the soldiers and how the war was going. And Uriah answered that all was well. David then said to Uriah, Go down to your house and bathe your feet. Uriah left the palace and a portion was sent out after him from the king's table. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the royal palace with the other officers of his lord and did not go down to his own house. David was told that Uriah had not gone home. So he said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why then did you not go down to your house? Uriah answered David, The ark and Israel and Judah are lodged in tents, and my lord Joab and your majesty's servants are encamped in the open field. Can I go home to eat and to drink and to sleep with my wife? As the Lord lives and as you live, I will do no such thing. David's going, ah, he's a noble guy. <laughs> he's not going to take the pleasures of home because of his, the sense of his to his general. I can't, I can't partake of this when I know my friends and my general are out there encamped. I can't do that. So this is the next thing. Verse 12. Then David said to Uriah, Stay here today also, I shall dismiss you tomorrow. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the day following, David summoned him, and he ate and drank with David, who made him drunk. But in the evening he went out to sleep on his bed among his Lord's servants, and did not go down to his home. The next morning David wrote a letter to Joab, which he sent by Uriah. Now this is going to go dark. So imagine, David's getting him wasted, thinking, Okay, I'll send him home. <laughs> And something will happen when he gets home. Okay? He doesn't make it there. Okay? So this is where the story gets dark. Um, so David sends a letter. Verse 15. In it he directed, Place Uriah up front where the fighting is fierce. Then pull back and leave him to be struck down dead. So while Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew the defenders were strong. When the men of the city made a sortie against Joab, some officers of David's army fell, and among them Uriah the Hittite died. Ooh. Now we got upset over uh, Bill Clinton back in the 90s. <laughs> Look what David did. Not only does he take this, this, this man's wife, then he has him basically murdered. Has him cut down in battle. Okay. Then Joab sent David a report of all the details of the battle, instructing the messenger, When you have finished giving the king all the details of the battle, the king may become angry and say to you, Why did you go near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Uh, and so you've got this, this little report that's going to go on. Now, verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband had died, she mourned her lord. But once the mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her into his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. 
but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. And now he's going to hear about it. Chapter 12, Nathan's parable. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, Judge this case for me. In a certain town there were two men, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had flocks and herds in great numbers, but the poor man had nothing at all except one little hue lamb that he had bought. He nourished her, and she grew up with him and his children. She shared the little food he had and drank from his cup and slept in his bosom. She was like a daughter to him. Nathan's really building up this story. Now the rich man received a visitor, but he would not take from his own flocks and herds to prepare a meal for the wayfarer who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and made a meal of it for his visitor. David grew very angry with that man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this merits death. He shall restore the ewe lamb fourfold because he has done this and has had no pity. Verse 7, Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. And then Nathan rakes him over the coals. Okay? And then David goes into this darkness, this time of repentance. And so there's consequences to this. Okay, so here's David. Israel's golden age. Very powerful. Things going well. He takes this woman that doesn't belong to him. She, he has the, the, the woman's husband killed in battle. Now there are consequences. One of the consequences is that this child that Bathsheba will bear will die. So remember what we said about sin. Sin brings death. Okay? And David will go through this period of mourning and will go through this period of, of basically redeeming himself. Um, and he will actually put on sackcloth. He'll pour ashes on his head. He'll go through this period of despair and sorrow. Okay? Now, David will not lose his throne. David will not lose Bathsheba. And in fact, Bathsheba will bear him a new child. If you go to verse 24, Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went and slept with her, and she conceived and bore him a son who was named Solomon. So there is redemption. This Archdiocese Today is available on home video. To place your order, call 636-0296, extension 1230. The cost for either DVD or VHS is $14.95 plus $2 shipping and handling. Or you may email video at archlu.org.